Congress averts the government shutdown for now. What must be done to get a full year budget passed? Produced by Defense News and Military Times, this is the Early Bird Brief. Each morning we bring you the defense and national security news of the day. We achieved a strong top-line agreement that allows our Appropriations Committee and, and all those who work on this to complete the appropriations process. It's an important part of keeping the government running. And VA officials are processing the most claims in its history, but the backlog continues to grow. What does this all mean for our defense and security? You'll find out. I'm your host, Simone Perez. Today is Friday, January 19th, 2024. A couple notes for listeners. Be sure to tune in on Monday for an episode on all the movies and shows troops should have their eyes on in 2024. And we would be remiss not to mention that yesterday we said goodbye to our longtime podcast editor, Jessica Edwards. Jessica is an extraordinarily humble person and never wanted any credit or her name to ever appear in the end credits of the podcast, but today we're making a very, very deserving exception, so she'll have to deal with it. While Jonathan and I have been the voices of the podcast, she has undeniably been the brains behind the operation. She is moving on to do other amazing things outside our newsroom. We are so excited for her, but of course we are very sad to see her go. Jessica, we wish you all the best. Now back to the show. First up, lawmakers on Capitol Hill averted a government shutdown by passing a short-term budget bill yesterday. Lawmakers are still trying to draft a budget for fiscal year 2024, which began on October 1st of last year. On Wednesday, House Speaker Mike Johnson addressed reporters about the top-line agreement. The top-line agreement includes hard-won concessions to cut more billions, as you know, from the IRS uh, giveaway and the COVID-era slush funds. It replaces accounting gimmicks from the prior FRA agreement. And it brings Congress much closer to regular order, which is our big commitment here. For more on the vote, Federal Times reporter Molly Wisner joins the episode. So Molly, how did lawmakers prevent a government shutdown this time? So the House on Thursday afternoon passed a very important vote to avert a government shutdown by midnight on Friday. That is when the existing continuing resolution was set to expire and funding for a handful of agencies would have run out meaning potentially that federal employees would have been furloughed and some government offices would be closed. That was the big risk this week going into the deadline, what with the snow days on Monday, also creating some difficulty in the schedule. But in the end, the House was able to get a two-thirds majority vote uh, in order to pass uh, the stopgap funding bill just hours after the Senate had provided um, support for the same measure. So the government is no longer looking down the barrel of a shutdown. Uh, The bill headed to the president's desk for signature. And now Congress has uh, a few more weeks uh, to figure out uh, what funding for 2024 is going to look like. Now, the other point to clear up here is that this uh, stopgap measure doesn't introduce really any new funding for agencies. It keeps them uh, at 2023 levels. So uh, there's not really an opportunity here for agencies to make any new starts, new contracts. Uh, They're really, again, uh, kept at the levels that they were last year. How does DOD, intelligence, America's military, how do all these agencies in America's national security apparatus play into this two-tiered continuing resolution? So in the first tranche of agencies, you've got military construction and veterans affairs. You have USDA, energy and water, and transportation and housing and urban development. And so this first group of agencies will be now held to a March 1st deadline. The second group will be held to a March 8th deadline, so about a week apart. And in that second group, you've got the Department of the Defense, you've got uh, state and foreign operations, as well as all of the remaining civilian agencies that aren't covered by the first group. Thanks, Molly. The short-term continuing resolution comes as lawmakers draft defense spending legislation at an $886 billion defense spending top line. If they don't meet that, it could result in a one-year bill pursuant to the debt deal that would cut funding for all federal agencies, including the Defense Department, by 1% from fiscal 2023 levels. 
Another important story, Veterans Affairs officials say they are processing more claims than ever, but they are still falling behind. Military Times Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane III breaks down the backlog with us. Leo, thanks for coming. Could you set up the situation for us? How many claims are VA officials processing, and what does this backlog look like? Yeah, look, this issue of how quickly VA can process claims has been one that's that's been going on for years. This uh, dates all the way back to some of the problems VA had in the in the 2013-2014 uh, time frame when there were more than 600,000 claims that had taken more than four months to complete. Um, so veterans groups and, and veterans themselves are very anxious whenever they start to see these numbers go up. And the, the backlog claims have been going up. They've been going up pretty steady for the last year or so. Uh, we're at over 400,000 now just at the start of 2024. Um, and that's for two reasons. One is because there's still leftover claims um, from the pandemic, from from when uh, things slowed down then, when when uh, VA workers couldn't come in on certain times and, and they fell behind. Uh, and because of the PACT Act. We've talked about the PACT Act a lot here, but it's a massive bill, uh, a toxic exposure uh, bill for uh, giving veterans benefits who were exposed to toxins while they were in the military. And that, um, you know, that has led to hundreds of thousands of more claims coming in. So there's this real way wave of, of claims coming in and we're seeing things, you know, fall out of date, even as VA is processing more claims than it ever has. Uh, last year, VA processed almost 2 million claims uh, in 12 months. That was a record. This year to date, they're they're up 34% over that, that uh, pace. So we could be looking at another record year and yet still VA could be falling behind for several more months. So what are officials saying is the key to dealing with a growing backlog? They, they're, they're optimistic. They're saying, they expected this number to go up, and they have been warning that this number would go up for the last six to nine months. Um, and they think that they'll get it back down to pre-pandemic levels as early as 2025, maybe even the end of this year. Um, but that's going to require some more hiring, some pretty high workloads. Um, VA has been working on mandatory overtime for VA employees for uh, for almost a year now. So um, these are all things that are designed to to up that up that workload, up their productiveness. But, you know, it's it's a large wave ahead, and we'll see just how bad it gets. Lawmakers said they're, they're prepared for this, and they know it's going to get worse, but we're starting to hear some rumblings from Capitol Hill saying this might be even worse than we thought, and is this a matter of VA needing a huge increase rather than what they were looking at just, uh, just in budget stuff uh, or some other approach to this problem? Also on your radar for today, President Joe Biden said Thursday that U.S. military strikes against Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen will continue, but he acknowledged that the American and British bombardment has yet to stop the militants' attacks on vessels in the Red Sea. The Pentagon said the United States conducted a fifth strike Thursday morning that targeted another missile launcher site. U.S. Central Command forces conducted strikes on two Houthi anti-ship missiles that were aimed into the southern Red Sea. Also last night, the U.S. US Central Command conducted strikes on 14 Houthi missiles at over a dozen locations. These missiles on launch rails presented an imminent threat to merchant vessels and U.S. Navy ships in the region and could have been fired at any time. The defensive actions this morning and last night were taken in accordance with the standing orders of the Secretary and the President, reflecting the inherent right to defend ourselves from attack or threat of imminent attack. Biden told reporters the strikes would continue before he departed the White House for North Carolina. The strikes followed an announcement Wednesday that the U.S. has put the Houthis back on its list of specially designated global terrorists. The sanctions that come with the formal designation are meant to sever the Houthis from their sources of financing. The Houthis have claimed the Red Sea attacks are meant to support Palestine against Israel's invasion of Gaza, but the links to the ships targeted in the assaults have grown more tenuous as attacks continue. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby told reporters yesterday that strikes will continue for as long as necessary. And now here's some other stories that we're hearing chirps about. Pakistan's Air Force launched retaliatory strikes early yesterday in Iran against alleged militant hideouts, killing at least nine people. Yesterday's attack followed one by Iran inside Pakistan on Tuesday. The USS Gerald R. Ford returned to its home port of Naval Station Norfolk this week following an eight-month deployment. Air and Space Forces magazine reported that Robert D. Gaylor died this week. He served from 1977 to 79 as the fifth Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. He was 92. Among other accomplishments, the outlet reported he was instrumental in bringing about uniforms for pregnant women. 
And on this day in history, in 1809, poet, author, and literary critic Edgar Allan Poe was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Poe served in the Army and even attended West Point. That's it for us this morning. To get more top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash ebb to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to follow us on social media at defense underscore news and at military times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted and produced by me, Zimone Z. Perez. Today's episode featured stories by Molly Wisner, Noah Robertson, Bryant Harris, Leo Shane III, and the Associated Press. Our editor-in-chief is Mike Roos. Have a great day. 